<coughs> Thank you, Brother Ralph, for leading us in those beautiful songs, and Daniel for the prayer. And also, uh, Brother Philip, in the scripture reading tonight, it is good to be here on this Lord's Day evening. And, uh, Appreciate it, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we might as well not worry about that tonight. We'll try it one more time. Uh, one reason I was doing this tonight is because that I know there are some people like uh, Sister Connie and others that are not able to get out tonight. So she, we want to pray for all of them. But if you have your Bible, I would encourage you to turn to Revelation chapter 12 as we are considering the woman in the wilderness. The woman in the wilderness. In Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7, he referred to the church in the wilderness, referring to the congregation of Israel in Acts chapter 7. And uh, we read, This is thy Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Well, obviously, the Lord's church, as we know it, was not established back there in the wilderness under the Mosaic law, although the law did point to the church. But we read of the church in the wilderness. God's people were in the wilderness. Later on, in the last book of the Bible, we read of the woman in the wilderness, and that's our topic this evening, the woman in the wilderness. And I appreciate Brother Philip reading that a while ago in Revelation 12, 1 to 6. In this passage, we read of the woman, and also we read of the dragon there in verse number 3. And that dragon is identified in verse number 9. And the dra great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. As we consider the woman in the wilderness, in our text being in Revelation chapter 12, I would like to read two verses in the chapter that refer to her being in the wilderness, and this being verse number 6 and also verse number 14. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, <coughs> that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. That's one thousand... 260 days. And then in verse 14, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And of course that being Satan. We are introduced to this woman in Revelation 12, verses 1 and 2. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. The American Standard Version says, a great sign. The King James says, a great wonder. We see the array of God is about her the sun, the moon, and the stars. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 16, And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. As we know in the book of Revelation, there's a lot of symbolism and figurative language. And certainly we see that to be the case here. We know that the woman is referred to in terms of glory, might, and power. John is seeing a vision, a scene given him from heaven. 
And Brother Bill Jackson in the annual dental lecture says, the vision involves the earth finally and men on the earth, but the scene as presented to him by vision is in heaven, end of quote. She is a woman with child, according to verse number two. She was to bring forth a man-child, according to verse number five. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ is betrayed by David as one with a rod of iron. I'd like to go back there at this time to Psalm 2 and read this passage, a prophecy of Christ in the second Psalm. And here David in the second Psalm, referring to Jesus Christ, says, beginning at verse number 6, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, I will declare the decree, the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. We know that Jesus Christ was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. The child here is to be a ruler and one before whom all nations are to be subject. And we know that the Lord announced before His ascension to heaven in Matthew 28, 18, that all power or authority hath been, been given unto me in heaven and on earth. So obviously this could be none other than the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, referred to here as the one who would rule with a rod of iron. Later in the book of Revelation, he is seen as the avenger sent from God to rule the nations with a rod of iron. This time we go to Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 15. And here we read, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. But now to the question, who is the woman? Some suggest that it is the church. Well, as we see later in the chapter, it would include the church. But it's not exclusively the church here at this point. We know that the church did not bring forth the man-child, but the woman did. So that is an important point for us to consider. We know that the woman refers to the church later in the passage. For example, in chapter 12, verse 14 to 17, we ask them, why would it not be the church here at this point in verses 1 and 2? Well, here at this point in verse number 5, the woman brings forth the man-child. We suggest that the woman represents the people of God seen first in the nation of Israel and then on into the Christian age as the obedient followers of Jesus Christ. Brother Bill Jackson says, we suggest that the woman represents the people of God and the plan of God wherein God would come into the world. Uh, Christ was to come into his own, John 1 verse 11. We know that he came into his own and his own received him not, according to that scripture. Christ entering the world with a redemptive plan was sufficient motivation for Satan to stand in opposition to him. And hence we have here in the early verses of Revelation chapter 12, <coughs> the reason why that the dragon stood before the woman ready to devour her child. So at this time, let's read verses 3 and 4. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, that is another sign, according to the American Standard Version. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. 
And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. That's Revelation 12, verses 3 and 4. According to Brother Burton Kaufman, the woman here is a symbol of the whole family of God, which Paul refers to in Ephesians 3, verse 15. And sorry, that would fit this context here. The woman was traveling in birth and pain to be delivered, according to verse 2 of chapter 12 of Revelation. Here we see the hatred and opposition from Satan to both the woman and the child already existed before the child was born. As the dragon stood before the woman ready to devour her child, there in verse number 4. The woman represents the faithful minority, the remnant in Israel during the long period of waiting for the birth of the Messiah. And so we know that Christ would come forth of the children of Israel. We know that is taught in both the Old and New Testament. In Micah, the fifth chapter, in verse number two, that he would come forth. And we read in that passage there a prophecy of the birth of Jesus. As we know that he was born in Bethlehem of Judea, or Bethlehem of Judah. According to Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, and we see that fulfilled in the New Testament. In Micah 5 and verse number 2, we read concerning the birth of Jesus. But thou, Bethlehem, after to though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. And so this is an attribute of God, the one born in Bethlehem of Judea, his goings forth are from everlasting. David says that this is an attribute of God. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God, Psalm 90, verse 2. And of course, we read how that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in Matthew chapter 2. Now we read of the great red dragon, as we just read, who stands in opposition to the woman and her child. It is Satan. Brother Frank L. Cox well points out that red is the color of blood. Satan destroys man. This dragon destroys people. He had seven heads and ten horns in the sign that John saw. He possesses all kinds of unholy power, in other words. The seven crowns or diadems do not symbolize lawful power, but usurp authority. Those are not like the crowns of victory worn by the saints that Jesus promises to the faithful in Revelation 2.10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. That's not what we see here that the dragon, the devil, has. It's not a crown of life given to the faithful, but it represents the power that he would have. He is prince in his realm. That's the idea here. Satan would be one of great power. And we need to understand that he does have great power. That he is one that is able to destroy and to overthrow. I'd like to turn to the book of Ephesians, the second chapter, and verse number two. This verse should tell us of the power of Satan. In Ephesians 2, verse 2, And who is under his control, that is the children of disobedience, those who are disobedient to God. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. In the sixth chapter of the book of Ephesians, there in verse 12, in the context of the whole armor of God, Paul said, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 
We know that the dragon's tail is an instrument of destruction, as we read there in the first part of verse number 4, how that he would even cast down a third a part of the stars of heaven. In Revelation chapter 12, the first part of verse 4, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Perhaps this is a reference to the fall of Satan, and we don't want to be dogmatic about that. But we do know that he has angels. We read of that in the scriptures. I'd like to look at chapter 12 here in verse number 9 of the fact, And the great, great dragon was cast out, the old, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his <coughs> angels were cast out with him. <laughs> and we could also read of that in Second Peter 2, verse number 4, and Jude, verse number 6. And we remember what Jesus said, that the lake of fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. As Jesus will say to those on the left hand, the goats, Matthew 25, 41, depart from me, you curse, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. We also read how that Jesus Christ saw Satan fall from heaven. In the book of Luke, the 10th chapter, in verse number 18. And this he said to his disciples when they came back, uh, having had the demons subject unto them through his name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. When God cast Satan out of heaven, it was a powerful and a lightning quick thing, was it not? As Jesus, the Son of God, beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And hence today, my friend, Satan is one who has now been cast to the earth, and he goes about seeking whom he may devour. He's a very powerful being. 1 Peter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. When we read these uh, things regarding Satan, it can almost put into us uh, a fear. And certainly, we should recognize the power of the devil. But we also should recognize that the power of Christ is greater than that of the devil. John said, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 1 John 4, 4. You know, we, we look at electricity. We don't play around with that, do we? Or water. It's powerful. But we don't play around with Satan either because he is powerful. We need to recognize our need for the Lord and His Word in order to overcome the devil, and we can overcome him if we will look to Christ and His Holy Word. Brother Burton Kaufman makes this statement, <coughs> beginning with the incarnation, that is, with Christ coming to the earth in the flesh, we have the efforts of Satan to destroy Christ while He is on earth. And failing in this, to destroy the church, and failing in this to wage war against the saints. End of quote. His position before the woman is to destroy the man-child. And we know that he put forth that effort through King Herod. In Matthew chapter 2, Herod wanted to find out where Jesus was, the one who had been born, because he wanted to take his life. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children in all the coast, all the children that were in Bethlehem, and all the coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. He was determined to destroy Jesus, but he did not get his way. God prevented that. But in the fourth place, we note here in Revelation chapter 12 that the woman brought forth a man-child. Let's read that again in Revelation 12 and verse 5. 
And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. There's a double emphasis here on masculinity. Alexander Campbell translates this. She bore a masculine son. Peter says, a son, a he-man, a fierce assertion of the virility of Christ. We know in Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 21, it was stated that his name was to be called Jesus. The angel said to Joseph, the husband of Mary, and she shall bring forth the son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. <coughs> this was to be a man child. And we further read the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 7 and verse 14 here in Matthew 1, verse 22 and 23. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. In the last verse of the chapter, verse 25, Concerning Joseph, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now we understand why the dragon, the devil, was so intent on destroying the Lord. We know that because of Christ entering into the world, that this would bring glory to God and salvation to man. In Luke chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. A Savior was born. Well, the dragon, the devil, didn't want that. He didn't want there to be salvation for man. In verse 14, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And back up there in verse 7 of Luke 2, And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. She brought forth her firstborn son. This, of course, is a reference to the birth of Christ in Matthew 1, 18-25, as we've just read. His birth would be the virgin birth, as predicted by Isaiah in Isaiah 7, 14, fulfilled in Matthew 1, 22 and 23. The result of his birth or by way of his coming to the world would mean salvation for man and glory to God. Isaiah said, For unto us a child, a son, is born. Let's go back and read that. Isaiah chapter 9, the well-known prophecy of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. We know here, according to Revelation 12, 5, that the son that the woman brought forth is caught up unto God and to his throne. We have no reason to doubt whatsoever that this is a reference to the ascension of Christ because when he ascended back to heaven, there in Acts 1, 9 to 11, he was sat on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, Hebrews 8, 1. The Son is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God, Hebrews 12 and verse 2. Ten days later, the church was established. That is, ten days after his ascension, the church was established in Acts chapter 2. But now verse number 6 in the fifth place. The woman flees into the wilderness. This is an interesting thought here. Let's look at Revelation 12 verse 6. Let's read that again. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's one thousand two hundred and sixty days. Homer Haley says, Since the redeemed have come unto Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, Galatians 4, 26, Hebrews 12, 22, the woman who now goes into the wilderness as the church, the new spiritual Zion, symbolizes all of God's redeemed people. 
We notice that the wilderness here is a place of safety for the woman that God had prepared for her. We note that Moses fled from Pharaoh into the wilderness as a place of safety. And Israel escaped from Pharaoh in Egypt into the wilderness where God took care of his people there. God nurtured Israel with manna from heaven and led her through the wilderness. Now, spiritual Israel, the church, is nurtured by the true bread which came down from heaven in the wilderness. We know that no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Ephesians 5, 29. So the Lord nourishes and cherishes His body, His people, the church. I'd like to go back there to the book of John, the sixth chapter, and read here a few statements from Jesus in John, the sixth chapter, beginning at verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This refers to Israel in the wilderness. They ate of the physical manna that God gave, the food from heaven, but they still died physically. But Jesus goes on to say, This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. And then, beginning at verse 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Now that Christ has come and provided redemption for man, we can eat of that spiritual manna that he has provided, that bread which is Christ, and we can live forever. We see the woman again toward the end of this chapter, Revelation 12, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on that this evening. We will look at that in another lesson. But except to say that we have the same thing repeated later in the chapter regarding the woman in the wilderness. We read in verses 13 and 14 of Revelation chapter 12. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. In other words, he persecuted the church. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. So we understand the 1,260 days of uh, Revelation 12, 6, and the time and times and half time here in verse number 14 to be the same time period referring to the same thing. And also a parallel back in the previous chapter, Revelation chapter 11, the 40 and 2 months. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. In the holy city shall they tread, tread underfoot forty and two months. So during the entire Christian dispensation, Satan would oppose the church. And this is symbolism here, the time periods given, representing the Christian dispensation. And the fact that the church would undergo testing and trials and persecution just as the children of Israel did in the wilderness. They were tried. And many of them fell in the wilderness, as we read in Hebrews chapter 3, and of course, in studying Old Testament history. Many did not make it to the promised land. They did not remain faithful. 
So the Hebrews writer warns us, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse number 12. Before we close here in just a moment, we notice that God <coughs> providentially cared for the woman in the wilderness. And this is still going on today. The church, the woman in the wilderness. God has given a place of protection for the church. If it were not for God's care in His nourishing and nurturing the church, no doubt the church would be destroyed. But we remember the promise of Jesus concerning the church, that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Matthew 16, verse 8. The woman is the true church here referred to. The church here, the woman in the wilderness, would be protected by God. And in spite of opposition, she would be preserved as an institution which Satan sought to overcome, that the church would not be preserved. That was his goal, but he failed because he could not overcome the hand of God. God is greater than the devil. The truth would remain, and Christ would remain as the head of His body, the church. Colossians 1, 18, Ephesians 5, and verse 23. Friends, this is a passage of great comfort. That's one reason we need to know the book of Revelation. God intended for us to know it. It was written to comfort and encourage the faithful undergoing severe trials and persecution. And today we still need that encouragement. God would providentially preserve her, the church. Let me give an example of that here in verses 15 and 16 of Revelation chapter 12, an amazing statement. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. A way of describing Satan's powers of destruction toward the church. Notice verse 16. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Now who do you think caused that? God did. God protected and preserved the woman in the wilderness. And this is the symbolism. God protects and preserves His faithful people, the church. He protects us. He watches over us. God will take care of the church. For it is a kingdom that would stand forever, Daniel 2, verse 44. And again, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And again, Jesus said, And lo, I am with you always, Matthew 28, verse 20. Satan's hatred of Christ's followers is evident. The last verse of the chapter, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. How did they overcome? They overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Verse number 11. Christ has defeated the devil. And I like to go back and read verse number 10 before we extend the invitation. John said, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which, the accuse, which accused them before our God day and night. Beloved friends, as members of the body of Christ the church, we have great encouragement here. And God willing, we won't study this at a later time in further detail. But what a blessing it is to be a part of the Lord's church. Today we are in the wilderness, a place of safety and protection. And do you know what God said concerning the children of Israel? Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. God bore His people on eagles' wings. And friends, today God will care for His people, the church. If we have any here this evening who are not a part of the body of Christ, the church, we encourage you to do that very thing, to obey the gospel, that you might be saved and added to the church. Acts 2.47 
by hearing, believing, and being baptized, Mark 6, 16, 16, 16, upon a heart of repentance, Acts 2, 38, and confessing Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Acts 8, 37, and being baptized in His name for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. If we realize that we are not a part of that faithful of the church, and tonight we need to return to the fold and be faithful again. We have that opportunity to repent and to pray God's forgiveness and confess our sins that He might forgive us. First John 1 John 1.9 and Acts 8.22 If this be your need and your desire, would you not come as we stand and sing together? There's a